The gaming industry consolidation continues this week as yet another gigantic company has initiated the purchase of a smaller but still pretty damn big and successful developer and publisher. A few weeks back, it was Microsoft announcing that they'd be acquiring Activision Blizzard, and now Sony has made a little announcement of their own. They'll be acquiring Bungie for a reported $3.6 billion. Obviously a, a smaller acquisition than the one Microsoft's working on, but it's certainly big news in the gaming space as the mega corporation gaming katamaris continue to just roll over everyone in the industry, collecting whatever they can in a war against each other for market domination. And what's crazy a little bit about this one, if for us old folks out there, yeah, uh, you probably know this, but Bungie and Sony's main competitor, Microsoft, were the same company just over a decade ago. Yeah. Uh, Bungie, You're gamers, you know that. Yeah, Microsoft yeah. bought Bungie back in the year 2000. Mm -hmm. And after the announcement of the original Halo and the relationship between the two seemed to be going great in the years that followed, it was... Uh, it was a match it made in heaven. It was a match made in heaven, yeah. yeah. Halo was obviously a runaway success, literally handing Microsoft its place in the console wars and helping make Xbox the titan that it is today. There's a fucking Halo show dropping soon. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, in 2007, just after the release of Halo 3, arguably the best Halo game ever made, yes. Bungie announced that it was splitting off from Microsoft and going independent. But Bungie continued developing the Halo series for Microsoft until 2010 when Halo Reach Halo Reach Around was re released. It was a fine game, sure. Uh, Reach was the final Halo title developed by Bungie before the franchise changed hands to 343 Industries, a subsidiary of Microsoft that worked on Halo projects outside of game development, but would now be tasked with handling the entire IP now that the relationship with Bungie and Microsoft had come to an end. Friendship ended with Bungie. Now 343 is my best friend. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was a great entire decade. And like you said, it... Halo kind of made Xbox. Yeah. Not just kind of. It was the flagship game. It was the thing that got people to buy consoles. It was uh, like sort of, I mean, I guess online multiplayer. It was one of the originators for, but originators even, for uh, like first person shooter online multiplayer. Right before online overtook local, it was the split screen game that every young boy played with his friends late into the night. And then when online came, it was the ultimate online game to play on consoles over We used land. to bring Xboxes over and you could connect them with like a data link and that yeah. would play on different TVs. It was yeah. uh, an exciting time. So, yes, it, this Bungie, the company, is very, very steeped into Microsoft. So it's, uh, it's very funny to see them go to Sony in this way. But yeah. uh, after they left, here's another connection. After they left Microsoft and went independent, they forged a new partnership with none other than Activision Blizzard who became the publishing arm for Bungie as they went on to develop a new space shooter franchise, the wildly successful Destiny and Destiny 2. And look, we know it seems like forever ago because of the pandemic, but all the way back in 2019, Activision and Bungie had a little falling out uh, where there was a lot of speculation about what was happening behind the scenes, as well as a lot of fanfare for Bungie dissolving that deal with Activision and going independent once again, because now, in theory... Bungie could do whatever they wanted going forward without Activision attempting to steer the ship and getting them to do things that they didn't want to do or follow certain development or release schedules or just nickel and dime everyone with more microtransactions. It's very easy to hate on a big company like Activision and then looking at Bungie and being like, now that they're free, they can really make the game that we always wanted. Mm -hmm. Whether that turned out to be true depends on whether or not you kept following Destiny 2 because they still have plenty of microtransactions, but it's a good game overall. And look, to be fair again, Activision, even back then, had a lot of baggage. And we are very sure that the executives over at Bungie are thanking their lucky stars that they were able to get out before things got even worse. Uh, plus, they just would have ended up back at Microsoft anyway, though with presumably even less leverage than before. But after like three years of going solo and weathering the storm of a global pandemic while still being able to push new content to their main title, Bungie has once again been acquired by a major player in the space, mm -hmm. Sony. And we are under the impression that Sony has much bigger plans for Bungie than just continuing the Destiny franchise as nothing more than a game with some timed exclusives for people playing it on their hardware. Yeah. If you hadn't noticed, the trailer for the Halo television series just premiered over the weekend. We're pretty sure that Sony would love to do the same thing with Destiny. They've already, they've already got that Last of Us show in development. Mm -hmm. uh, it's... Destiny has really fun characters and pretty good storylines. So... What I would definitely watch a Destiny show. The Halo trailer, I'll watch it. But Halo, 
you know, they have already peaked with the live action adaptations of Forward Halo. Unto Dawn. The forward Unto Machinima Dawn. Machinima Prime. <laughs> Machinima Prime perfected Halo, okay? Wow. Yeah. Uh, but what Sony doesn't want to do, allegedly, is make it so that Destiny is only a PlayStation exclusive title. That's good. Yeah. It's the same way that Microsoft was quick to note that games from Activision Blizzard would not be restricted to Xbox or PC. Uh, why would you? That's perfectly good money. Why would you? <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, it's a smart it's move. It's a smart move. These companies would otherwise be closing their doors to incredibly lucrative streams of cash. They've got plenty of exclusives already. Mm hmm. Uh, but the focus definitely seems to be on world building with Destiny and any new IP that Bungie develops moving forward while at the same time staying hands off when it comes to creative decision making. Yeah. Uh, here's some excerpts from the announcement by the president and CEO of Sony Interactive Entertainment, Jim Ryan. I want to be very clear to the community that Bungie will remain an independent and multi-platform studio and publisher. As such, we believe it makes sense for it to sit alongside the PlayStation Studios organization. And we are incredibly excited about the opportunities for synergies and collaboration between these two world-class groups. I've spent a lot of time with Pete Parsons, Jason Jones, and the Bungie management team to develop the right relationships where they will be fully backed and supported by Sony Interactive Entertainment and enabled to do what they do best, build incredible worlds that captivate millions of people. In a separate statement, Bungie CEO Pete Parsons added, in Sony, we have found a partner who unconditionally supports us in all we are and who wants to accelerate our vision to create generation-spanning entertainment, all while preserving the creative independence that beats in Bungie's heart. Like us, Sony believes that game worlds are only the beginning of what our IPs can become. Together, we share a dream of creating and fostering iconic franchises that unite friends around the world, families across generations, and fans across multiple platforms and entertainment mediums. Today, Bungie begins our journey to become a global multimedia entertainment company. So this deal still has to actually close, but compared to the Microsoft Activision acquisition, this is small potatoes. So uh, we highly doubt there's going to be any regulatory hangups involved. Um, and this is you know, probably another piece in the puzzle for Sony uh, because they even announced recently that they're going to be doing something uh, akin to the Xbox Game Pass, even though they actually beat Xbox to that yeah, rate, like, to that punch. but it was bad. So they keep <laughs> trying and failing and rebranding, and yeah. eventually they'll get it right, by God. Um, but yeah, yeah it, it does appear that they are uh, retooling their previously done uh, excursion into the subscription-based model. Uh, and hopefully they'll get it right this time because they do have a a vast catalog of very good exclusives. Yeah, and they've they've started releasing some of them on PC, which is crazy. There's like, a God of War just came out like two weeks ago, right? Yeah, and I believe the first Horizon, mm -hmm. uh, Ghost of Sushimi, I think. Delicious. <laughs> Ghost of Sashimi, I believe, <laughs> yeah. is coming to PC. It's um, not the same game. It's uh, it's kind of a cooking game. But yeah, if they did the same thing where you could get Sony on the PC like Xbox Game Pass does. That would be very enticing. Yeah. And it is funny to think just, well, time passes really fast now, but uh, uh, it was like the original Xbox One release where the marketing for it, I believe that was the one where the marketing for it was like, we're not just a game console. Oh, yeah. We're actually your uh, cable set-top you box. Netflix. We're got all it's Spotify. This is just a, a Roku with yeah. some games on it. Yeah, you can play games, I guess. But, and uh, that must have done just horrific damage to, to them internally because they immediately flipped back and were like, no, we're, we're a gaming company. Yeah. We swear to God. Yeah. Uh, anyways, uh, for the near future, for Bungie, for actually you, the consumer, this probably isn't going to mean very much. They'll continue to work on Destiny 2, uh, and it'll probably be more than a few months, if not a year or two, before we get something substantial that's new out of this partnership, uh, at least something that's big enough to a tribute to Sony's acquisition. Um, still, much like with any acquisition of any company anywhere, the threat of layoffs at this company being acquired, it's always a risk. And while we hope that doesn't happen, it does seem like an inevitability. We just don't know uh, the scale, and we won't know for a while, or maybe ever. Um, also, yeah, it continues the trend of shrinking the entire games industry into a few very big, very powerful companies. Sony, Microsoft, Nintendo, and I, to a lesser extent, because I guess they're not part of the console war, but Epic and Tencent are massive. Uh, same company, by the way. Yeah. Um, these companies are all really starting to look like AT&T, Verizon, and Comcast. Only these gaming companies might have the potential to have even more power than those telecoms when and if that godforsaken metaverse project actually fully becomes embraced. So... Just one request. No NFTs, please, Bungie. Please, can you hold Sony off? 
Can you say, no, we don't want to do NFTs. That would be great. No fucking thanks. You're going to want this Cade 6 rotating no. NFT. No, I'm not going to want that. You can only earn cool new weapons that are tied to the blockchain. Uh, no, no. Just give me my games. Please, you're yeah. turning these... You're turning my fun into a job. Yeah. Uh, speaking of absolutely massive gaming acquisitions, a game that's currently far bigger than Destiny and Call of Duty combined was recently acquired by a company that has uh, barely anything to do with the gaming space. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm yeah, for all the real gamers out there, you might take offense to this classification, but oh uh, yeah, yeah, they might. It is a fact. The biggest game in the world right now, <laughs> yeah, is something called Wordle, and the New York Times just bought the fucking thing. Yes. So if for some reason you have no idea what Wordle is, and I honestly, I see people post the little squares on Twitter. Oh, I'm hooked on like, it. I uh, I don't I don't really I know it's a game involving guessing words. There's actually I, a thread in our uh, Discord now. Uh, by the way, people always ask when we mention it, it's Discord.gg/internettodaytv. Um, but there's a thread now, sub thread for just posting your worlds, and it it is fun for the reasons that we'll explain. And I've been posting mine there today. Two tries, got it on the second line. I'm yeah, the world king. I, people seem to like it. I don't know. I, I kind of, I, I like that I still have only the vaguest uh, concept of what it even is. Well, I'm going to see how long I can go. I, no, you're going to know right now because I explained Ah, it. shit. And you're going to actually tell people what it is through my words that I wrote for you. Oh, well, it was a good run. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, if you don't know what Wordle is, I guess you're disconnected from the modern world like I am. Yeah. Um, and I guess we'll give you some credit and myself for avoiding mainstream popularity up until this point. Great job, Elliot. I generally play games a year or two after they come out, so Wordle, <laughs> Wordle was on the schedule for like 2025 for me. Yeah, you'll have a lot to catch up on. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, this, this Wordle game took the world by storm. It turned an extremely simple yet challenging game into a quest for bragging rights and popularity, and also giving the world something to talk about that isn't political, divisive, or upsetting. So here's the premise. It's just a word guessing game. You get six chances to guess a five-letter word. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I, I guess I, I, it's very. I surmise that much out of it. Yeah. I still don't understand. Like, they're like, oh, six slash three, and then there's like, green squares and red squares and well, white Elliot, squares. Well, Elliot, get ready. Uh, you start with nothing, all blank, and you use a random five-letter word of your choosing to start. Could be anything. If you get. Oh, you choose the word. Yes. If you get oh. any of the letters within that word correct. They will be either yellow or green. Green means you have the right letter in the right place for the word. Yellow means the letter exists in that word, but it's in the wrong place in your initial guess. Any other letters that are on there, they don't exist in the word. I'm already confused. So you write like... Uh, uh, am I trying to guess their word or they guess... Like, am I guessing they have my... a word and you're oh, trying to guess it. they have a word. Yes. I see. Okay. So, yeah. It, it, let's say your first guess was like blast. And... Uh, the L is in the right place. It's I green. See, I see. So the, see. their word starts with an, or the second letter will be an L. And then uh, S is in it somewhere else. I so see. that'd be yellow. It's a, So it's like Wheel of Fortune. I, no. <laughs> it's, it's closer to maybe Boggle or a no, Look, it's very simple. So it sort sounds of like confusing. Words with All you have to do is play it once and you'd understand. Eh. You know what? Get your phone out and play it while I describe. Nah. Anyways, from there, I wouldn't even know where to go. Wordle.com. You just Google it. And that's what's great about it is before this, it was just on a website, like the old days. Yeah. Um, so yes, green, right place, yellow, correct letter, wrong place. From there, it's a process of elimination and brainstorming to figure out how to work with the remaining letters to figure out the word. It's very simple. It's fun. And it is slightly challenging sometimes, but nothing that really makes it more special than boggle or crosswords or anything else in the word guessing genre, except Wordle is also a social game in the sense that you can share how you've done with people on social media or over text without giving away the actual answer so that others can still play and see how they did compared to you. And also you can see where people got things right or wrong and how you use those letters to complete the puzzle. Okay. It's fun to be like, look, I got it in two guesses today. Why wouldn't you just lie and be like, oh, I got it in first guess again? It wow. would be so much work to create the actual like thing. Yeah, it's just emojis. Why would someone do that? It's like people who cheat in that uh, words with friends. Yeah, yeah. Like, it eliminates all of the fun. <laughs> like you were supposed to draw it. You just wrote the word. <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah. Anyway, so the game Wordle it basically allows the, all of this by using 
an extremely simple way of sharing. You just it's just text that identifies the day's puzzle, and then a series of colored emoji blocks that replicate the finished game board as you saw it with black, yellow, and green blocks, showing your guesses every step of the way. Uh, we can only understand its sudden and explosive popularity as a uh, sort of safe communal activity that's not depressing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a water cooler conversation that delves into politics or someone's stance on vaccines or mask mandates. It's, it's just, hey, I guessed the word, and it took me three tries. What about you? Yeah, it, finally. Nature is healing. The word was vaccine. No, <laughs> no, God. <laughs> Too many letters. No. No. Anyway, yeah, it's the warm blanket that a lot of people need right now. It's, mm -hmm. it's this year's Tiger King. <laughs> uh, I, that, that show uh, had a lot of divisiveness, too. Uh, to, seeing how the people show up to do his court cases with free Joe Exotic shirts, shirts and stuff. Yeah. Wordle, as long as the word isn't divisive, it's just fun to be like, how'd you do today? Yeah. Great. We're having fun here. We're having a conversation. Just a nice conversation between two red-blooded Americans. Yeah. Uh huh. Anyway, this is all very low tech. It's sort of like uh, Among Us. They're just like, oh, this is the most popular game in the world. This looks like shit. <laughs> this is <laughs> yeah. like barely runs. This is yeah. a flash game. Mm -hmm. Wordle is a fucking website. It's not even an app. Yeah. It, it kind of harks back to the glory days of the internet before everything was an app. You, yeah. you actually have to go to a website to play it. Wow. Yeah. It's like, uh, what's that drawing game that's on a website that's pretty fun? We've done streams of it. Uh, Something.io. Yeah. Uh, no, but it reminds me of like when you used to go to, you used to go play mini golf on the Lifesavers page. Yeah. Lifesavers.com slash mini golf or some shit back in the early 2000s. What a fun time. Yeah. No apps necessary. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you, you go to a website to play it. Uh, what a concept. But mm -hmm. that is going to change real soon because the New York Times over in New York City acquired the Wordle game from its creator. Yeah. That's that. They own it now. Uh, and you are going to love the person who created its name. Yeah, I, I, oh, I, I know his name. <laughs> okay, good. It's pretty... I'm <laughs> like, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> Seems like a person who loves fun. Yeah. Uh, the Times has brought plenty of traditional games into their own standalone apps over the years, including crosswords and spelling bees. So, yeah, we wouldn't be surprised if you saw Wordle on the App Store within days or maybe weeks, considering how simple of a game it is. I'm sure that the app developers of the New York Times are like, yeah, we cranked it out in about two hours. Yeah. It's uh, not complex. But here's the news of the acquisition directly from the outlet that acquired it. The purchase announced by the Times on Monday reflects the growing importance of games like Crosswords and Spelling Bee in the company's quest to increase digital subscriptions to 10 million by 2025. Wordle was acquired from its creator, Josh Wardle, a, <laughs> a, a, a software engineer in Brooklyn, for a price, quote, in the low seven figures, the Times said. Which is interesting because uh, just recently, the Times, when their their uh, wire cutter section was like threatening to go on strike, they're like, "We need, we need seven hundred thousand uh, dollars extra budget to you know pay these people what they're worth." And New York Times is just like, "Oh, jeez, I've got no money in these pockets," and then they they immediately go and drop like fucking ten million dollars between or one and ten million on dollars. This stupid fucking app. Well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is it is definitely going to drive more traffic to their uh, stuff. But it, who's going to subscribe to the New York Times to play Wordle? I mean, I subscribe to the New York Times. Yeah, for reasons, for the articles. Yeah, but I do the crosswords because they're a nice bonus. This is like buying Playboy for the articles. Never happened. They did wonderful articles. They did. And uh, a lot less problematic than the other stuff that's been in there. But those articles, as good as they ever were, that was just uh, for the afterglow period. <laughs> Oh, God, I feel like shit. I should probably learn something. You didn't read those articles till the rest of the pages got stuck. Yeah. The articles were edgy. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Oh, damn. Gas prices in the 70s. They could never get any higher than this. Time to look at some boobs. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, uh, the, the article continues. Uh, the company said the game would initially remain free to new and existing players. Initially. Yeah. That's a qualifier that wouldn't be necessary if... It wasn't absolutely going to eventually <laughs> not be free. Hope you liked Wordle, yeah. dorks. Anyway, yeah. it'll cost you twenty dollars a month. <laughs> Add that to your Could subscription you imagine? file. Yeah, a dollar a day. It's thirty dollars a month. Anyway, the article continues. Wordle, the name is a cheeky pun on its creator's name. No shit, has had a striking rise. It first appeared on a no frills ad free website in October and had ninety users on November first. That number grew to three hundred thousand by the middle of this month. 
And now, millions play the game daily, according to the Times announcement. Mr. Wardle told a Times reporter this month that he had started Wardle... At, sorry. Wordle, Wordle, Wordle. <laughs> that he had started Wordle after he and his partner got really into the Times crosswords and spelling bee games during the pandemic. Quote, New York Times games play a big part in its origins, Mr. Wardle said in the company's statement. And so this step feels very natural to me. And yeah, like we pointed out, it feels a bit unnerving to see that the company very explicitly stated that the game would remain free for now, implying that they would start to charge a fee for it. But uh I'll take this one because I am someone who plays the New York Times games, Elliot. Elliot. Uh, if it's anything like their other offerings, it would be safe to assume that the daily Wordle would be free, but that you could purchase Wordle packs uh, or something like that for an additional fee or as part of a, an overall subscription to the Times. Like they have, as long as they don't make it like that damn cooking section, uh, I'm a subscriber. Where's my recipes? It's like, oh, haha. That's actually Oh, you want recipes with your Times? Well, that's going to be another subscription, buddy. I actually think that the full crossword is extra, but they do the mini crosswords. I like those. Yeah. And I have bought mini crossword packs when I'm on like a going to fly somewhere. Oh, look at fucking these. Stanley from the office doing <laughs> crosswords. <laughs> They're fun. Jesus Christ. They keep Christ. your brain moving. So anyways, I like Wordle. Uh, I think you would like it if you gave it a you, shot. You like Mr. Wordle? Uh, well, I like him. The, guy, he, the man or the app? I like him because he developed a game that I can log into once a day and, and uh, flex my big old brain. So, thank you. Anyway, let's move on now from gaming acquisition news to an update on the very dumb, very loud, loud drama that is continuing to play out regarding Spotify, Joe Rogan, and uh, an ever-increasing list of legendary artists who are pulling their music from the platform in protest to the spread of COVID and vaccine misinformation on Joe Rogan's show. Yeah. So let's get the basics out of the way really quick. This latest protest started when Neil Young sent an angry letter demanding that his songs be removed from the streaming service because, according to him, Spotify could have Joe Rogan or have Neil Young, but not both. Mm -hmm. And this was because of Young's justifiable anger at Spotify for not just hosting Rogan's show, which has millions of listeners who are exposed to Rogan's thoughts on the pandemic, masking, vaccines, and so on, but... Uh, Especially that Spotify had paid him $100 million for the exclusive rights to host the podcast while at the same time paying bands, musicians, and songwriters next to nothing for access to their entire catalog. Yeah. Also, Neil Young, very upset about that sound quality. Just unacceptable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. This bit rate is, is trash. Mm -hmm. That was the real excuse. He was just waiting. He was just waiting for Joe Rogan to fuck up too many times yeah. to use it in his He'll spend $100 million excuse. on this guy, and uh, I can't even get flack files on this fucking thing. Bullshit. Yeah. Anyway, some of the blame does fall on the record labels themselves for uh, artists not just getting screwed. In fact, I'd say most of the blame does, but yeah. uh, we are all aware by now of how little any of these streaming platforms pay anyone unless you have a special exclusivity to deal with them. Uh, Steve Albini had a really cool thread on Twitter today where he basically went into like uh, the economics of this and he's just like, Bands I was producing and in in the 90s that were running out of completely independent record labels were making the same on like a thousand copies as major label artists were making on like 50,000 copies because of just like the way major label deals work. Uh, and he, he breaks down the economics of it. It's, it's very predatory. Well, it's also too like major labels like kicking down the door of like an independent or like a, a smaller band being like, Welcome to the label. Uh, we're going to get you this producer, this, this. They, they're spending so much fucking money to produce the album. And they, the artists only get paid after that gets recouped. Right. So, so they're yeah. like, you, we're going to give you an advance of $1 million. But he, ex I, didn't, I didn't even know this. Steve yeah. Albini explained, he's like, the advance covers the cost of recording. Yeah. So that's not what, their money. What you actually get <laughs> yeah. is what comes after that. And often it goes into the red on that. So you get literally nothing. Yeah. There's a lot of uh, very... Very cool accounting that goes into uh, creating everything that you consume for entertainment. Yeah. And uh, the people who actually are at the very bottom of creating it typically get nothing. The worst compensated. Yes, yeah. exactly. So, yeah, it's it's not so much that Spotify is hosting controversial content that people don't agree with. It's the fact that Spotify paid an obscene amount of money to own, promote, and host this content on their platform exclusively. Content that is, at its best, controversial, and at its worst, 
literal medical misinformation that's being normalized to an audience that's large enough that there are almost certainly victims within that audience who have died from the virus because they avoided vaccination. And look, Joe Rogan admits that he's an idiot, and he has also flip-flopped on his stance on a multitude of issues over the years, even vaccines themselves. There's plenty of compilations that you can find online where Rogan is uh, recorded praising vaccines and slamming skeptics and then cutting to clips of Rogan becoming a vaccine skeptic. He's he's essentially a goldfish yes. when it comes to a lot of stuff. The problem is that, I mean, he probably sees himself as hosting a variety of opinions through his guests on his show, the whole spectrum. But that is like absolutely, objectively not the case. He, yeah. he very much favors the more paranoid, reactionary types of guests. And He'll occasionally have a token... Uh, more left voice on there, but it's it's much more often the uh, especially during the pandemic being the people who are actively against it. He did have a great one. I can't remember the guy's name. It was this Australian like viro virologist who just uh, was like, "No, no you're look wrong. it up, look no, it up." No, and then they looked it up, and, like, and he was like, "Wow, he's right." And then yeah. he's like, "Yeah, but like, uh, he definitely does hide that a lot under." And this is well-known knowledge, but the uh, I'm just asking questions yeah. kind of like uh, guys. But it's like, if you're going to do that, that's fine. But you do have a large audience, and I think you have somewhat of a responsibility to, at the very least, in your next episode, be like, hey, so we actually fact-checked the stuff that went on in that freewheeling live conversation that we posted last week, and here's a couple notes we might have. Or maybe put that at the end of the episode before putting it up. Instead of just being like, I don't know, I'm stupid. <laughs> I'm stupid. They gave me $100 million for this. That was dumb. Yeah. Well, also, um, he has access to all of the data even before the Spotify acquisition and like can see which guests uh, garner uh, more yeah. engagement and listens and yeah. w is going to lean into that. Yeah. And he's leaned into like the controversial, like all these fucking uh, intellectual dark web guys get off on being controversial mm -hmm. and uh, saying the stuff they, they don't want you to say. And like, that's definitely a part of his appeal and his shtick. And he, yeah. he leans into that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, Spotify, Spotify is trying to have it both ways. Like this isn't a one-to-one, -one, the same thing as like uh, someone like Tucker Carlson being on something like Fox News, but the, Spotify is not passively hosting well, it's just Rogan's like, podcast. They it, are giving this man an insane amount of money. That's the thing is like with the what, exclusive rights to it. He used to post and do episodes on like YouTube and every other platform, and it's like, all right, he's just using content yeah. platforms that are that are available. Spotify's like, we're gonna give you a hundred million dollars yeah. to only go through. This us. is our guy. This is no our one else show. Can have him. He's yeah. ours. But I don't know. Whoa, whoa. What, why are you asking us about the things? He's why are saying? people mad at us for doing stuff? Anyway, regardless, the point is that Spotify is not just hosting the show. They paid him very handsomely yeah. to do it. They paid him beautifully to do yeah. it. So artists- It's a big deal. Yeah, musical artists are obviously upset and they have every right, if they so choose, to protest the service that a lot of times they don't even have a choice of appearing on. That's their free speech. Mm -hmm. So last week after the initial news about Neil Young wanting to pull his catalog from Spotify went viral, Spotify apparently just agreed to remove it. Sure. And then a few more artists came out to also throw jabs at Spotify. They all fall pretty firmly in the boomer category. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> yeah. Joni Mitchell threatened and then successfully removed her music from the platform. Uh, <laughs> James Blunt really stepped up, but he went the other way with it. He yeah. threatened to release more music <laughs> if Spotify doesn't remove Joe Rogan. Yeah. So that's a fun uh, Bruce Springsteen's guitarist, Nils Lofgren, pulled his music. Mm -hmm. um, and I, this is like, the conversation around this, I think, is more interesting than the Rogan aspect of it. Because again, it's, it's brought up a lot of aspects of the economics of the music industry that most people don't think about. We're like, yeah, it has pulled back the curtain like, in a very good way on like, how uh, these artists are receiving royalties. David Crosby, uh, Neil Young's bandmate from CSNY, he was asked, he, he's been posting in support of Neil Young. People are like, well, are you going to pull your music? And he's like, I literally can't. I sold those rights like 30 years ago. No control over it. Yeah. And yeah, a lot of other people, it's like, well, you're telling me I have no Neil control. Young is the young from Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young? That's right. I thought that was just a band name. <laughs> he's Crosby, he's Stills, he's Nash, he's Young. <laughs> I thought it was just a really cool sentence. Yeah. Uh, anyways, the dumbest coverage and social media conversation about all of this has to be the fact that uh, people online, including some outlets, were reporting that these protests had actually cost Spotify billions of dollars in stock value. People who look at the stock market once a year and like, wow. Wow. And look at exactly one stock. Wow. <laughs> On the day that news breaks. I don't know what a larger uh, market trend is. <laughs> uh, obviously, the value of the company was immediately and demonstrably crippled by losing 
these three discographies. You did it, gamers. And while it might be true that uh, the company did suffer some financial setbacks due to this, people giving themselves and Neil Young credit for crashing the stock price of Spotify, uh, they don't take into account the entire tech sector and honestly, the entire stock market absolutely shitting the bed over the past month. It would be like people saying that Neil Young's protest against Rogan also destroyed Tesla or Twitter or Intel stock. Yeah, it took down the whole market. (laughs) It's that powerful. (laughs) Neil Young doesn't understand the power that he he wields. He actually caused the Great Depression was caused when (laughs) Neil Young pulled his music from Spotify. Crazy. No, the whole market dropped consistently over the course of a month. Uh, Not that this has anything to do with how we feel about this protest. It's just another one of those hilariously misinterpreted moments where a bunch of people virtually shout, we did it, Internet. And there was I saw so many posts that were just getting shared like crazy of people being like, here's a list of artists who have pulled their music from Spotify. And it's like so they're like oh, Paul McCartney, like there's all these people I'm like, no, what are you doing? You're spreading lies. <laughs> yeah, people not getting, real. And people would point that out and get yelled at and like, oh, oh, so you support uh, vaccine skepticism? Like, no, I, just, I support <laughs> not just spreading fucking lies on the Internet. <laughs> this is, no, this is bad and like, dumb. You're spreading misinformation right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, that's why I don't go on Twitter. Anyways. <laughs> so, yeah, at the start of this week, Spotify and Joe Rogan himself did release statements acknowledging the issues that have been brought up over the past week. And in typical tech platform fashion, uh, they're just going to slap a little warning on things. And uh, that's about it. Yep. Done and done. And seriously, in their big newsroom statement about the fact that they're technically paying someone to spread misinformation, they just sort of state that the company has Publish this platform rules and they're going to add a little content advisory to any podcast episode that includes a discussion about COVID-19. They're talking about COVID. That's the same as spreading misinformation about COVID. That's Just, so uh, frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> There's COVID talk in this, yeah. so I don't know. Might not, be true, might be false. Not specifically a podcast that's sowing doubt about the efficacy of vaccines. Just any podcast that talks about COVID-19 in any context. Just, our work here is done. But you didn't do anything. Didn't we, though? This is like, uh, I mean, YouTube still terrible when it comes to talking about the virus. But uh, early on in the pandemic, ta- mentioning COVID at all, inst- instant demonetization, yep. instant like uh, getting bumped down in the algorithm. It's like there's a fucking global pandemic, Susan. What there's, the fuck? What else are we supposed to talk about? Yeah. And now they do just do the little thing. It's like, uh, did you know that? Uh, did you know that COVID's a virus? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They just put a little Wikipedia link. Yeah. Or a CDC link or something, which is exactly it's what Spotify same, is going to do. Same thing. But they're not just hosting this content. <laughs> they're promoting they're it. Promo- they it. own it. It's theirs. They have exclusive rights to it. Yeah. It's not the same thing. Uh, anyways, for his part, Rogan released a video on Instagram where he defends himself, but adds that he'll he'll bring on more guests with differing opinions and try to do his best to make sure he's researched uh, the topics that he talks about on the show. Um I don't put much weight in that statement at all. And he has always brought on guests with differing opinions. It's just the rate at which he talks to people of differing yeah. opinions and not ones that he already has a predisposed idea uh, and, and agreeance with. Yeah. He doesn't have, like, he has good takes. He, has, he does. He has bad takes. He has good takes. He's just not a very smart person. It's, it's just very unfortunate and weird that he is arguably the most influential man in the world that's what's that's uh, what's crazy about this, especially the <laughs> like it wouldn't be such a big news. deal if he was just a guy. Yeah, the, but, the uh, news articles in the past week have actually shown that Joe Rogan is one of the most influential people on earth. Sorry, which is, uh, fucking insane. Yes. Some, someone pointed out that uh, the same guy, the same NBC executive, uh, launched both The Apprentice and Fear Factor, and then went on to be the CEO of CNN when Trump ran for president. Wow. And said this Trump guy's great for ratings and just started airing his entire uh, rallies just uncut. And uh, that man, I believe his name is Jeffrey Zucker. uh, Also responsible for a lot. Also very influential. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, apparently. Uh, But anyways, if you're looking for an alternative uh, to Spotify based on how much you're actually contributing to artists by listening to their music, T-Pain uh, posted a breakdown a while back that shows how each of the platforms pay out based on how many streams equal $1 uh, going to the artist. And it's probably not 100% accurate down to the exact number of streams. And also, there's a lot of people eating from that pie yeah. as well. I see graphics like this get passed around. And they, they're, I, I don't know. I, they're never quite the same. You, you know, they don't post sources or anything. It's but... also it's completely different if uh, Elliot's band hosts something on Spotify and gets paid for those views versus a band that's signed to uh, yeah. like Warner Music 
and how much they're going to get paid versus those or because of those views because a lot of people down at the record label are going to take a lot more out of that yeah. royalty check. Yeah, it goes through a lot more hands before it reaches you. The 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 last like big one that I remember where an entire specific generation of people were like brought to speed on how bad record labels can fuck people over was uh when it all became public information how much Victory Records was paying their artists back in the uh I want to say late 2000s. Mm -hmm. It doesn't sound right to me, but like 2007 the late to aughts. yeah. Um, and it was like people. There was bands like Hawthorne Heights and Atreyu, or uh, I don't know which ones exactly it was, but were posting photos of their royalty checks uh, next to their gold records. Yeah. And it was like they got paid like a dollar fifty, and they had gold and platinum records. Yeah. So uh, people have been getting fucked over for a very long time in the music industry. Yeah, the money's um, all in touring. Yeah. And licensing. And record labels have uh, worked their way into that, too, with something called the 360 deal, um, which really came into uh, around that same time, like the 2010s. We were just like, ah, oh, crap. You know, we, they oh. make a lot more money if yeah. we controlled all of their touring and merchandise and everything yep. else. Yep. You don't so, have to worry about anything. Let us handle it. Mm -hmm. Now, surprisingly, uh, Napster still exists, and they're on top of the list for payouts. And unsurprisingly, hmm. YouTube is dead fucking last. But honestly, if you really want to contribute to your favorite artists, especially smaller artists, use Bandcamp. Bandcamp is a wonderful service where you get a really good royalty because you're sending it almost directly to the artist. Almost directly. Bandcamp yeah. does take a cut, but they do. I don't know if they're still doing it for a while. They were doing uh, Bandcamp Friday. Friday, where yeah. it goes 100% to the artist. Or go to their actual websites. Yeah. Uh, there's. I mean, it's been pointed out, but it's just like the idea that paying $5 a month gets you access to the entire history of recorded music yeah. has always been completely absurd and uh, unethical and and kind of doomed to fail. So, like, it's not a matter... If you really are concerned about the ethics of this, switching from one service to the other isn't really going to change much. Yeah. Apparently, Tidal pays great. But, Tidal uh, pays great, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So there you go. Maybe we're all switching to Tidal now. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I... I this whole thing has made me think uh, a lot as I'm like looking at my my library and shit. And it's like I use Spotify a lot. I use the, the I use features. It a lot, and it's yeah. like if I were to go actually like buy all my music, it would cost me like five thousand dollars. I mean, I know that firsthand because I own a lot of vinyl. Yeah. If I really liked the past couple of years, if I really liked a record, I went out and bought it on vinyl because of that. And I worked in the music industry for a long time, so I I get it, and I always yeah. felt good contributing to artists, whether it was buying a t-shirt or buying a uh you know an actual physical piece of physical media but uh, also going to shows really helps i know you can't really do it a lot now and things keep getting postponed but that's a great way to help um yeah buy a vinyl record because then you get to look down on everyone else yeah. <laughs> it's not only does it sound superior i'm actually supporting the artist as yeah. you play it on your fucking crosby <laughs> <laughs> That's the funniest thing. It's like just the shittiest just, vinyl. Yeah, presents. buying like a hundred and fifty like dollar like yeah. hundred and eighty gram ultra limited vinyl and like putting it on a fucking like Crosby like portable with a yeah. speaker that's that big. Good turntables are expensive. They are. They are. It took me a while to finally bite the bullet and get one. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. let's move on now from news that makes everyone angry to something that can bring the world together but also something that we would assume is probably pretty dangerous. <laughs> uh, so a YouTuber named Handy Gang wasn't satisfied with portable chargers that could only top off a cell phone a few times before being drained themselves. He wanted something bigger, something better, and something that could power the phones of nearly anyone who needed a charge while still being portable, technically. A typical portable charger these days can range anywhere from 1,000 to 50,000 milliampere hours. It's a wide range. It, allows consumers to choose based on how heavy they want that brick to be versus how long they're going to be away from another power source. But yeah. Uh, yeah. You get a little small one if you're just going out for the day. You get a bigger brick if you're going on a trip somewhere and aren't sure that you're going to have access to good quality power. Yeah. So, you know, you have a variety of things to, to buy. But Handy Gang, his custom-built portable charger, it's a whopping 27 million milliampere hour, six feet long, four <laughs> feet wide, and a foot tall. It's enough to charge around 5,000 smartphones from wow. dead to full. And according to the video on his channel, which we'll link below, his DIY portable charger boasts 60 sockets and can also power and charge other power banks, laptops, a washing machine, or even some electric bicycles. Washing machine? Doesn't that use that weird uh, European outlet to get uh, 220 volts? Well, his, got, his has all the outlets. Wow. It's got all of them on. It's the ultimate travel companion. 
if it wasn't six feet long, three feet wide. But uh, by the way, yeah, th this, it's only portable in the sense that you can put some wheels on it and drag it around town yeah. on a rope. Uh, <laughs> if you didn't uh, assume that already. Basically, this guy is never running out of juice again. And if he does, you probably won't see him for about a week while he takes this giant battery somewhere to recharge. Hopefully on some big company's outlet. Yeah, how long does it take to charge this thing? Uh, well, so I have one of those like 30,000 yeah. ones for like flying, and that takes a while. So I'd imagine this probably, yeah, a couple days at least. Wow, yeah. It's like 900 of That's them. That's why you got to have two together. of them. So. Yeah, you have a, so you have a new one ready to go. A backup. Have, yeah. Now all he needs is to make like a uh, equally gigantic backpack to wheel it around in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you can't bring this one on a plane. They'd probably have a problem. No, with it. it's basically a bomb. <laughs> so yeah. leave that one at home. Speaking of bombs, I didn't do a whole thing on it, but uh, this week is the 15th anniversary of, of Boston <laughs> thinking that they were being uh, bombed by Aqua Teen Hunger Force LED uh, marketing signs. I remember that when it happened. Yeah. It was all very, very stupid. Yes. It was the best dumb inside joke because aqua Teen, it was big but it wasn't like big big yeah it wasn't like rick and morty big it was uh so it was kind of funny to just be like these people think this is bomb and anyone who saw it was like no that's the moon Knights. yeah come on <laughs> anyways yeah happy 15th anniversary to that do you feel old yet but yeah this this big charger thing it's it's impressive and it is the kind of content that makes youtube fun so we're happy to see more of it even if it is ridiculous very silly yeah Anyways, if you haven't already, please watch our most recent episode of Weekly Weird News. And uh, we also have a new episode of News Dump over there for you. Check both of those out, and we will be back for some tech news coming up soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.